Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this privilege once again. We thank you because you made us to come before you to know your mind, have your revelation, know the truth of the word of God. We are praying, O oh Lord, you will assist us by your spirit, so that your intended truth and meaning and message will be given to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that this word will strengthen us, will encourage us, will lead us aright, and our faith will grow as a result of the study in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that you even prepare us so much that we'll be able to teach others also. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to the Bible study today. Today we are having study three in our new series of studies in the Epistle to the Hebrews. And it is very important that you come regularly to these studies. One, this will be the first time we are systematically going through the Epistle to the Hebrews. And it is so rich that without uh, the knowledge of what we have in the Hebrews, your real Christian experience and understanding of the gospel and the supremacy or superiority of Christ over all things before, all things after, all things past, all things present and future, your knowledge of the superiority of Christ over everything available, visible and invisible, will really not be complete. Therefore, it's important that you come every Monday to these studies we're having together. Not only that, you should understand that a real study of the Word of God is the backbone of every believer. And it is a cornerstone of this ministry and church. Studying the Word of God will make us strong. Studying the Word of God will make us appreciate God more, know God more, honor God more, worship Him more. Knowing the Word of God will increase our faith. Knowing the Word of God will give us assurance and anchor in our souls. The more we study the Word of God, the more we'll be able to receive comfort and confidence in the Lord. It is so important, it even makes us channels of blessings to other people. Now, as uh, I need to remind you of the, some of the things we have studied in our past two studies, the epistle to the Hebrews was written to Jewish believers to emphasize the truth that the new covenant is better than the old covenant, that Jesus Christ is better priest and better mediator, and is a final priest and a final sacrifice at the same time. I need to explain that. You see, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice was always different from the priest. Because the priest took the sacrifice, killed the sacrifice, offered the sacrifice to God. There was no way in the Old Testament the sacrifice could be the same as the priest. No way. But you see, for the Lord Jesus Christ, He was the sacrifice. Behold the lamp of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Not only that, He shed His own blood. Not only that, He went with that blood to the very throne of God to make intercession for us and atonement for our sins. But then, it's also the priest. It's the one that offered it. It's the one that presents it. It's the one that even so pretends and, or that oversees everything to make sure that the blood is as effective as it ought to be. Why couldn't the priests of the Old Testament do that? One reason, if they did that, if they died, one, that will be, animals, that will be human sacrifice, that will be acceptable to God. Not only that, they were imperfect. And therefore, there was no way they could die for their own sins or for the sins of other people. Then, if they died, how will they rise again then to appear before God and still to be the priest? But Jesus Christ, because of his resurrection, he rose again and is now continually in the presence of God as our high priest making intercession for us. This epistle is telling us 
that the old covenant, although mediated through the angels, yet we need to understand that the new covenant is mediated through Jesus Christ if we are to prove that the new covenant is greater than the old covenant. We must then prove that Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new, is greater than the angels, the mediators of the old. That's why the uh, writer of the epistle to the Hebrews is making us to understand that Christ is greater. He is uh, showing us in this epistle that Christ is greater than Moses, greater than Aaron, greater than Joshua, greater than Melchizedek, greater than all the Old Testament kings and priests and prophets. Not only that, he even goes beyond the world, beyond the earth, and he says it's greater than the angels too. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. His purpose is to show that Jesus Christ is greater by far than the angels. But then before we can really appreciate the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, in a comparison that the writer is making, we need to know the identity and the ministry of the angels. If you are saying that Jesus is greater, how great actually are the angels? Because if you know how great the angels are, then you will be able to know how much greater, more powerful, wiser, eternal is Jesus Christ. Therefore, that means that we're really going to go through the study today wanting to know some facts about angels, wanting to know the nature of angels, wanting to know the ministry of angels. As you look at the outline, you will see that there are so many references of Scripture. Well, that shouldn't surprise you. There are 108 direct references to angels in the Old Testament. And the average reader would think that there will be less references in the New Testament. But do you know that we have more references in the New Testament? We have 165 direct references to angels in the New Testament. Now, that will really strike you when you think of the composition of the old and the composition of the new. It means that the ministry of angels in the New Testament are actual, is actually conspicuous. Now think about this, that in the Old Testament you have 39 books, in the New Testament you have 27. And listen to this, although the books are more in the Old and fewer in the New, you actually have the mention of angels more in the New Testament, not only that. Although you have in the Old Testament a period of more than 2,500 years when the revelation was given in the Old alone, when you think of the time of Moses to the time of Malachi, and yet you have in the New Testament, when you really think of the writing of the New Testament, you are thinking of about just about 100 years, in fact, less than 100 years, and yet... Even though you have so many years in the Old Testament, we have the mention of angels less in the Old than in the New. That will change some concept you may have because, you know, the average Christian feels that there is not enough mention in the New Testament of angels or there is not enough ministry of angels in the New Testament. Actually, the opposite is the truth. That you have more ministry, you have more mention, you have uh, many mention of the angels in the New Testament. And yet, Christ, remember what I said before, takes the center stage. Even though we have the mention of angels in the New Testament so many times, and they had quite a lot that they were, they were doing. As you go from Matthew through Mark to Luke to John, to the Acts of the Apostles, to the Epistles, and through to Revelation, you just have those angels coming up and coming up again. Yet, Christ takes the center stage, and Christ is still greater and higher and better with a more excellent name than all the angels that you find in the old and in the new. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 again, being made so much better than the angels, 
as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Today, we're going to look at general facts about angels. We're also going to look at the nature of angels, and we're going to look at the ministry of angels. I said there are so many references on the outline, there is no way I can possibly read all those references and comment on them and explain them and apply them within the short period that we have for the Bible study. I'm trusting that you'll be so much interested in the study of the Word of God, you will take this outline yourself and you'll go through the references later when you get back home. Now, let's go to point number one. General facts about angels. Looking at the outline, we learn that angels were all created before man. They do not have the infirmities that we have. They are of a higher order than man. That means the angels are an amazing creation of God. Originally, all those angels were created and there was the possibility, listen to this, the possibility of sinning and of falling. But after the fall of Lucifer, and then he got some angels after him that rebelled with him. The remaining angels in heaven were no longer subject to sin. God just had to touch their nature, renew their nature. At a point in time, after Lucifer had fallen with some of the angels, that now since that time, angels can no longer sin, can no longer be subject to sin. Of course, Satan and the fallen angels will be tormented forever and ever in the everlasting fire at the end of this age. But now talking about the holy angels of God, God's holy angels now are sinless, are pure, are holy, are powerful, are wise. How many are they? Even though Satan left and do not hear referring to. Well, if you start from verse 2, it's taught that it says, must be very intelligent. They must have advanced in technology. And so upon the believers have guardian angels. Remember when Peter came out of the prayer of the place where they were praying. And then Rhoda kept on saying, it is Peter, it is Peter. And he said, you are beside yourself. Peter could not be here at this time. That's what we are praying for now, that Peter should come out of prison. And Rhoda said, but God has answered the prayer. Peter is here already. Oh, then they concluded, it must be his angel. Those believers knew that believers have guardian angels. The angels are so innumerable innumerable in uh, luke chapter 2 luke chapter 2 when christ was born uh, you know that if we talk of the ministry of angels i'll say come back to that I'll, co I'll come to that later you will see that the angels actually at the conception of christ at the birth of christ in the ministry of christ in the time when he was praying in the garden and even after he was ascended into heaven the angels still appeared the ministry of angels uh, they are just all over there in the pages of the new testament now in luke chapter 2 luke chapter 2 reading there from verse 8 and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe swapped, uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Listen to this, verse 13. And suddenly there was with that angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. Now the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass which the Lord has made known unto us. Now you will see here a multitude of angels. 
It says in verse 13, heavenly host. And the heavenly host refers to in verse 15, the angels of God. So you can see that the angels are innumerable in number. Number one, they were created by God. Number two, in number, they are innumerable. I told you before that they do not uh, marry and they do not uh, procreate to increase the number by giving birth to other little, little baby angels. No, that doesn't happen. In Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. It's talking about a glorified, resurrected saints. It's saying that in a resurrection body, there will be no marriage and there will be no giving, of, uh, giving birth to children. It says we'll just be exactly like the angels who do not marry, who do not get pregnant, who do not uh, give birth to children. I said also according to the word of God, that as angels do not marry, they also angels do not die. In Luke chapter 20, Luke chapter 20, verse 36, Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels, and are as are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now, as you have seen in the word of God, angels were created. They do not have the infirmities that men have. They are an amazing creation a higher order than that of man and i told you that angels are no more subject to sin they're wise they're mighty they are powerful they are holy and they are innumerable but then we also know something although they are wise and mighty and intelligent we need to say that those angels are limited they have to be they have to be because it is God that is unlimited. It is God that is omniscient, omnipotent. It is God that is uh, omnipresent everywhere, every time. Although the angels travel at inconceivable speed, at a very fast speed, yet they are not like God, omnipresent everywhere. It's only God that is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. That is all-knowing everywhere present and almighty but the angels are limited actually in matthew chapter 24 verse 36 matthew chapter 24 verse 36 but of that day and hour knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only there are some things known to god alone there are some things known to the lord alone that even the angels do not know now, how do these angels appear whenever they appear? Here is something we need to learn. Now, you need to understand that spiritual beings are different from physical beings. You see, an animal uh, that is immediately that animal comes to this world, is, uh, uh, is uh, in this world, that animal is just in that form all the time. You see a sheep here, if you transport that sheep to another part of the country, it's the same uh, appearance. You see a man, the same appearance. You see a woman, the same appearance. In the case of angels, they are so created that if they were to be visible, there is a possibility that they can appear in a different form when they appear unto men. Now, you see, I need to say this because we need to understand the, the marvelous creation of God. For example, they can so appear to man that man may not even know that this is an angel. Will be normal. The appearance, the dressing, the look, everything will be normal. That uh, the man will not be afraid of the, of the angel. At other times, uh, they could appear unto a man. And a man could be thinking, well, this is just a man like myself. Like when the angel appeared to Manoah, and then the uh, Manoah and the wife uh, said, let us uh, make something for you. And when they made that thing, instead of eating, it just uh, made fire to come down. The thing was uh, smoking. And then in that smoke, that angel just left like that, and they saw him go to heaven. 
You see, man cannot do that. But then, at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when the angel appeared, you need to understand that the appearance of the angel, it was terrific and terrifying. Not like just ordinary men, like appear to Cornelius, that appear to others like that. This was a different appearance because these now really show the brightness and the glory and the majesty of the angel. In Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28 in verse 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door, so mighty and powerful that only that single angel could roll away the stone, and then search upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment as white as snow. For the fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. You see, those angels could appear as normal uh, human beings, as if there is nothing to be afraid of. But at other times, the angel could appear that even the soldiers would tremble and quake and shake, as if they were dead men, not able to see, not able to behold. But we need to know that at, uh, most of the time, they appear just like Ordinary men. Look at this in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 3. And he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God. Notice that, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. And they said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial unto God. Remember, he didn't say unto me, because this is just an angel, not God. He is not God, therefore he could not say, Your prayers have come up as a memorial unto me. He said, It has come as a memorial before God. Now it appeared there, and it's named as angel. Look at verse 30. And Cornelius said, For days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. He was actually talking of the angel, but he said, you know the way I can describe him? I look at his face, I look at his arms, I look at his legs, I even look at his dressing. I can just say, a man appeared unto me. So, the angels often appeared in the form of man. But then, there is something we need to notice as New Testament believers. We should never worship angels. Never Never worship angels. Actually, angels are to serve the believers. They are ministers, they are servants to the heirs of salvation. I'll show that to you later as we go on in the study. You don't worship a servant. You don't worship your messenger. It will be something ridiculous. If you as a boss, if you as a director or manager, you got, uh, you know, to the very gate of your office, and as the porter opens the door, as the gate man opens the door, you with your portfolio bag, you just prostrate on the ground for your messenger. Your messenger will be calling your assistant, your deputy, uh, saying maybe a uh, uh, master needs to check up in the hospital because something must be going wrong. But what happened? Well, the boss director prostrated for me. It will be very strange. That's why we don't worship angels. We who are the children of God and the believers, we are the people that the angels are serving. Oh yes, they are great. Oh yes, they are mighty. Oh yes, they are so terrific that uh, their look might even terrify the soldiers and the keepers. All the same, the Lord has made them to be servants and to be ministers unto the heirs of salvation. And that's the reason we cannot and we will not and we must not worship them. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18. Colossians chapter 2 verse 18. Let no man beguile you, deceive you, make you go astray of your 
of your reward in a voluntary humility and the worshipping of angels. Let no man beguile you. Let no man deceive you. Let no man lead you into losing your reward because of a voluntary kind of pretended religious superstitious humility and the worshipping of angels intruding into those things which he has not seen vainly popped up by his fleshly mind. You see, there are some people that in their church, uh, they make so much of those angels that they worship them. Well, actually, because they are not born again, because they do not know the Lord, because they do not have the knowledge of Scripture, the revelation, the feel that the angels can, re can reveal, uh, the feel is so great that the only thing they can do is to worship those angels. Look at um, Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is spirit of prophecy. You see here we are told that John, uh, when he saw those revelations, and he saw the various things that have been revealed through the angel, uh, by the means of uh, the angel, or instrumentality of the angels, he fell at his feet. He forgot himself. And the angel immediately said, you can't do that, you mustn't do that, you never do that again. Because I'm just a servant. You see, all, in all these uh, white garment churches, if all those angels, they were worshipping, all those angels they have been singing to, all those angels they have been mentioning their names and worshipping, if they were true angels of God, those angels will tell them, don't worship me, worship God. What in the way land? Those angels are fallen angels. They are fallen spirits. Because Satan likes to be worshipped. Satan likes to say, bow down, worship me. And the demons like to be worshipped. And the fallen angels like to be worshipped. That's what you find in Matthew chapter 4, from verses 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All this is will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Satan loves that. He wants to be worshipped. The false uh, fallen angels, they like to be worshipped. In fact, the Antichrist, that will be one of his preoccupations. He will set himself in the temple of God, saying that instead of worshipping God, the people of that time should worship him. And therefore the fallen angels are the angels, the personalities that the white garment people are worshipping. We've seen some facts about angels. And even though those facts are so marvelous and, and great and wonderful to us because we're human beings, we have our frailty, they are so strong and they are so mighty, uh, the tendency for human beings is to superstitiously want to worship angels. No, we don't worship angels, they are actually serving us. That leads us now to point number two, the nature of angels. The nature of angels. Well, there is a lot we can say about the nature of angels. Let's just go through a few references and see the nature of these angels. One thing you will realize is that they are not like men and women. They do not share the frailty, the weakness, the tiredness, the uh, infirmities that we have because they are of a higher order. Look at the word of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 4, Be made so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be a father, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, here is their nature, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. He maketh his angels spirits, 
and he maketh his ministers a flame of fire or a flaming fire. That you find as a quotation from uh, Psalm 104. Psalm 104 talking about the nature of angels. Psalm 104 and in verse 4. Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. But then as we talk of angels as spirits. That means those angels do not have blood, bones, flesh as we human beings have. Jesus Christ tells us that spirits are different from humans. In Luke chapter 24 verse 39. Luke 24 verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see for a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. Therefore the angels that are spirits are different from men and women that have flesh, bones, and blood. Uh, then we are told of uh, their nature, their might, and their power. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven... With his mighty angels. Those angels are mighty. In fact they are so mighty that one angel could destroy 185,000 of the Assyrians. You think of the might of angels. The strength of angels. The power of angels. There is no comparison between an angel and a battalion. An army of people. No matter how armed those soldiers are. A look at an example in Isaiah chapter 37. Isaiah chapter 37 verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and hundred and four score and five thousand. One hundred, four score, that means four times twenty, eighty and five. One hundred and eighty-five thousand of those are Syrian soldiers who are armed to the teeth. Seriously armed. Only one single angel came and destroyed all of them in a moment of time in the night. And when they arose early in the morning, when people arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. And so you find that those angels were actually mighty in strength, Excellent in power too. Now they were they are also holy, also holy. Uh, from the time of uh, Lucifer that he fell, and then he fell with some of those rebellious angels. Since that time, the rest of the angels, still innumerable in number, now they are holy. That's what you find in Mark chapter eight, verse thirty-eight. The latter part of verse thirty-eight, when he comments in the glory of his father. With what kind of angels? With the holy angels. Holy angels. It is the holiness that uh, makes us know that uh, they are always uh, hearkening to the word of the Lord. Always obedient to the word of the Lord. Always observing and doing and obeying the commandments of the Lord. Psalm 103 verse 20. Psalm 103 verse 20. It says in that verse 20, Blessed, Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. Three things about the angels there. The excelling strength, excelling power, excelling might. Not only that, number two, they do his commandments. And they do the commandments of the Lord promptly, without delay. Without question, God says, here is what to do, and in a moment of time, they are off to duty. They are off to do it. You know, when the Lord taught us to pray, He said, we shall pray that we here on earth will do the will of the Father on earth as it is done in heaven. He's telling us that grace shall come into our lives and change us and transform us. That the slowness in our character, that the retardation in our understanding... 
All that should be taken away that we the believers here on earth now should be obedient to the Lord as the angels do the will of God in heaven. In fact, in a time of the millennial reign, when Christ will reign here on earth, then will that prayer be completely fulfilled that those on earth, the resurrected ones, and also the people we are ruling over, they will be doing the will of the Father on earth as it is done in heaven. How do the angels do the will of God in heaven? They are always observing the commandment of the Lord promptly, without question. That means they are doing it willingly. There is no hesitation. That means they are doing it sweetly, sweetly. They are fast about it. There is no delay. They just carry out the will of God and they do it wholeheartedly. May God give us the grace that we on earth, who are the children of God, will so do the will of God, that the strength of God will be in us, the, the, the strength and the power, the grace of God will be within us, that we so obey the will of God, the word of God, like those angels are doing as well. Well, these are some of the things we can say about the nature of angels. Those angels, oh yes, they have a superior nature to that of men. Man in the present stage is lower than God's holy angels. Angels are not like men. Men are plagued with infirmities and weaknesses. Uh, men are prone to tiredness and sickness and death. Men are limited by time and by physical conditions. Men living on earth right now are subject to frailties and to, oppress and to oppression, which angels who are living in heaven are free from. While men can be tempted, angels cannot be tempted now. While men can sin, angels cannot sin now. While men can fail God and be lost, the innumerable angels of God now are holy and sinless. Hunger, thirst, weariness, and decay are known to men today in this age. All these things, hunger, thirst, weariness, and decay are not known to angels. In fact, according to the word of God, angels are spirits, not having flesh and bones like men. As I told you, angels are powerful and mighty. Only two angels destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That you find in Genesis chapter 19. A single angel, I read it to you, smote 185,000 and Assyrians in one night. Angels are holy and obedient to God. They are intelligent and wise and glorious and immortal. They are heavenly spirit beings. They need no rest. You need rest. After walking for some time, you cannot walk a whole day without needing rest. But angels don't need any rest, and they can appear visible or invisible. They can move at inconceivable speed. Angels can speak, do you know? They can speak the languages of men. Doesn't matter where you are. Those angels just come in and they drop their language, and they drop their message, and they speak exactly in the language you are speaking. Because angels spoke to Abraham in the language Abraham spoke. Angels spoke to Lord, spoke to Balaam, spoke to Manoah, spoke to Elijah. Angels spoke to Daniel. And angels even spoke to Zechariah and to Mary and to Joseph and to the shepherds and to Peter. And do you remember that angel even spoke to Paul? He said, the angel, uh, the, the angel of the Lord whom I serve, he was with me tonight. And this is what he told me, that there will be no loss of any man's life. Oh yes, angels speak in the languages of men. Is, uh, are they limited to the languages of men? Well, you know they are not limited because in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 1, Though I speak with the languages of men and of angels, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, angels also have some languages that are peculiar to them. That it's only when you get to heaven, you will understand that language and speak that language too. It's a wonderful thing to study about these angels. But now we need to note the ministry of the angels. That brings us now to point number three. The ministry of angels. Now, the, the ministry is so broad and the ministry is so wide 
that it will be impossible in just a short period like this to cover everything. But let's look at this. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy foot too? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Are not all those angels ministering spirits, that is, spirits that minister, spirits that minister, they are sent forth to minister for them who are the heirs of salvation? Now, you see the privilege of a Christian, the privilege of a believer. Maybe you are a believer, and uh, you may even be a messenger in your place of work, and you do not have anybody serving you. Maybe you are a believer, and you do not have even a maid, you do not have a young uh, person uh, running errands for you. Maybe you are a believer, and uh, in your place of work, you do not even have a secretary. That's all right. But you even have angels greater than men, angels greater than women, angels more powerful than soldiers or policemen, angels more powerful than anyone on earth. Do you know that those angels are serving you? They are supposed to serve you. You may not see them. Many times you see the believers did not see the angels. A few times they saw them. But you remember when that servant of Elisha woke up in the morning and he saw the Syrian army all surrounding the place where he and his master Elisha, where they were living. He didn't know that there were any bodyguard, any soldiers, any spirit beings around them, supporting them, surrounding them, defending them. He didn't know there was any protection sent from heaven. And yet he said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? But that master Elisha knew. He knew that these angels of God are always there. And he prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And God opened the eyes of that young man. And he saw around them chariots and horses and angels riding on those horses coming to protect Elijah. Or coming to protect, rather, Elisha. In the case of Elisha, it was uh, the, the, the angel that brought the food. And the angel said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too long for you. Uh, you know, God is so wonderful. He'll make the whole creation to serve you. As I mentioned the case of Elijah, you know the other time, when it was by the brook, it was um, one of the birds, a raven. That will bring the food. But at this time now. In the time of discouragement. It was even an angel of God that came. And brought the food and said. Elijah I came to serve you. You see we may not always see them. But they are serving the children of God. They are serving the people of God. It says. Are not. Are they not. All ministering spirits. Sent forth. To minister for them. Who shall be heirs. Of salvation? In what way do they serve the believers? Well, I told you there are so many references. I cannot read everything, but let's read a few. For our own encouragement. For the upliftment of our own faith. To understand that our God is still alive and is working these mighty things in our midst today. Look at these references. In um, Psalm 34. Psalm 34 verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. The angel of the Lord delivereth the people that fear the Lord. Now Psalm 91. Psalm 91 reading from verse 10. In Psalm 91 verse 10 here is what the word of the Lord says. There shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. Why? What's the means of protection? That plagues and sicknesses will not be able to penetrate in our dwelling places. Verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They follow you around 
and they are keeping you in all your ways. I refer to the case of Elisha just now. Let's read that directly from the word of God in Second Kings chapter 6 from verse 13. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore send he hither horses and chariots and a great horse, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city both with, with horses and chariots. And the servant says unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And, the, and he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Understand, the angels many times are invisible. These heavenly spirits many times are invisible. But although you cannot see them, they are always there. And they are innumerable, uncountable. In verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Full of horses and of chariots of fire round about Elisha. Let me remind you. When God needed to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent only two angels. When God needed to wipe out and destroy 185,000 um, Assyrian soldiers, he sent only one angel. In this case, to protect only one servant of God. Only one prophet of God. He didn't send just one. He just, didn't send just you. The mountains around were full of horses and chariots of fire. So many angels sent uh, to protect Elisha even at that time. There's nothing for you to fear. Even if it's in the lion's den, the Lord is there and is going to protect you. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, verse 22, Daniel 6, verse 22, Eli uh, this man, Daniel, had been cast into the lion's den. You know the story? Uh, people had conspired together, and they had made the king to make a decree that nobody should pray to any god anywhere except to the king for the space of 30 days. And uh, the king uh, had signed that document and signed and uh, effected the decree without knowing the trap he was getting into. And then Daniel will not respect that kind of edict. He went to pray anyhow. And uh, when he prayed, then they cast him into the lion's den. The king was concerned. He woke up early in the morning. He wanted to know whether uh, Daniel had been safe and secured and had not suffered any hurt. And he went to the side of that den. And he cried with a lamentable voice to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? And here is the answer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 verse 22. That, and uh, my God has sent his angel. My God has sent his angel. And he has shut the lion's mouth. That they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me. And also before the O king I have done no hurt. You will see that. The angel went there and protected him. Well, there are a lot of references I could have read. Maybe you are saying those references are Old Testament. Psalm 34, Old Testament. Psalm 91, Old Testament. Second Kings chapter 6, Old Testament. And Daniel chapter 6, Old Testament. Are there references in the New? I'm sure you are a Bible student. You know references in the New Testament concerning the ministry of angels to the, to the believers today. First of all, let me show you the ministry of angels to the head of the church. 
before I come to the uh, church, to the members of the church. Let's talk about their ministry to the head of the church, to the cornerstone, to the one that is achieved, the shepherd of the fold. In Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, and in verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, at the time of the temptation. Of course, you know that at the time of the conception, an angel went to Mary. You know that at the time when the, the pregnancy was on, the angel gave the message to Joseph. You know that after Jesus Christ was born, angels went to the shepherds watching over their, over their sheep by night. And you know that uh, during the ministry of Jesus Christ at this time, in the time of the temptation, you know that angels went to minister to him. And it went on till the time of the betrayal and the time when he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. In fact, he said when he was betrayed, when Peter took that uh, sword and cut off the, uh, the uh, ear of uh, the servant, uh, of the high priest, Jesus said, put your sword back. If I wanted, I could have called 12 legions of angels. They would have protected, defended me. And then when he was praying at the garden of Gethsemane, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 from verse 41. And he was uh, withdrawn from them about his stones cast. And kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And so you will see that from the conception to the pregnancy to the birth and to the time of the temptation and to the very end of his ministry, angels were always in attendance ministering unto him. Do you remember on the day of resurrection, the very day he rose from the dead, an angel came and rolled the stone away from the tomb. And so the angels were still there. And then on that day when he ascended from earth and he went to heaven, the disciples were looking and here appeared angels again. They appeared like men in white apparel. And they were talking to them saying, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus will come in like manner as we have seen him going into heaven. So you will see that concerning the head of the church, the angels ministered all the time when he was here in his earthly ministry. How about to the believers? To the believers, to those of us now, members of the church of the living God. Well, you need to know that the angels are still ministering to us because we are told, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Let's look at their ministry to the believers. In Matthew chapter 18 from verse 10. Matthew chapter 18 verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, that is, these little ones that believe in Christ. For I say unto you, for in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven, the least in the kingdom. In fact, even the babies and the young children, their angels behold the face of my Father which is in heaven heaven. That makes us to understand then, if these little children have angels protecting them, you better believe that you as a believer, even if you are a new convert, you have angels of God protecting you, assisting you, surrounding you, to deliver you and to shield you from all harm. But then it is not only that, uh, you know, we have those angels uh, for those uh, little children, uh, for the believers as well. I alluded to this before. Let's now read it directly. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. Acts, chapter 12, from verse 5. And Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And God answered that prayer, verse 7. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. 
and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And uh, his chains fell off from his hands. The angel conducted him outside the prison. And when he uh, thought about where he will go, in verse 12, when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose son name was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to her king, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And he said unto her, Thou art mad. He said, You are beside yourself. You are not saying correct things. Don't you know it is that Peter we are praying for and we want him to be out of the prison. And this uh, girl kept on confirming and affirming. Oh yes, God has answered the prayer. God has delivered him. He's knocking at the gate. But she continually affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. Those believers knew that Peter had an angel watching over him, surrounding him. And just like you need to understand that every believer has angels surrounding, protecting, defending them. In Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, from verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, and all day that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. That means then the angels are still ministering today to those who are the heirs of salvation. I told you there are so many references you'll need to go through on your own. But then let us uh, summarize the ministry of angels. Angels ministry includes bringing answers to prayer. Daniel chapter 10. The ministry includes making God's revelation known unto men, Daniel chapter 9. And the ministry includes protecting believers, Psalm 34, Psalm 91. They have the ministry of delivering and directing preachers, Acts chapter 5. And then these uh, angels, they fight against the enemies of the believers. That you will find in uh, Numbers chapter 22, also in Acts chapter 12. These angels strengthen believers in trial. Luke chapter 22. They lead sinners to the true gospel preachers. In uh, Acts chapter 10, they reveal God's truth to disciples. Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 27. They receive departed spirits of believers to heaven. When Lazarus died, we are told that the angels of God came and took him right to the bosom of Abraham. And you remember that when Jesus was about to be arrested in the garden, Peter drew the sword and Jesus said he could have called 12 legions of angels for protection if he wanted to. Matthew chapter 26. And as we look at the records of the Bible, the Bible records many appearances of angels to men and to women and to people that they minister to. An angel appeared to Hagar to counsel her. An angel appeared to Lord to warn and to deliver him. An angel appeared to Jacob to wrestle with him and to bless him. An angel appeared to Israel to protect the children of Israel. An angel appeared to Gideon to encourage him and commission him. An angel appeared to Manoah to inform him of the birth of a deliverer, Samson. An angel appeared to Elijah to feed him and to strengthen him. An angel appeared to Daniel to protect him from the lions in the den. An angel appeared to Zacharias to prophesy of the birth of John the Baptist. Appeared to Mary to predict the conception of the virgin and the birth of Jesus. To Joseph to confirm the supernatural conception of Mary. 
and to the disciples, to the shepherds to inform them of the birth of the Savior. To Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to assure them of the resurrection of Jesus and the angels appear to many others in the New Testament. The ministry of angels for the heirs of salvation continues today and will continue to the very end. You will, you will remember many testimonies we have heard in our church here. In our church here, we have found that sometimes um, little children in our church are kidnapped. And then they are taken somewhere. And then eventually while the, uh, those little children are there with some other children, maybe they still have their Bible in their hand. Those people may try to take their Bible, throw the Bible away, or throw the Bible down. And while they try to shave their head before they perform their rituals and their occultic and uh, wicked uh, things that they wanted to do in their mischief, then a light will appear. And then these uh, children will be asked, from where are you? And they will say, well, I am a child of God. I'm from deep alive. And we, we have had many stories over and over. How the, uh, fa the fellow there will say, why did they bring a deep alive fellow there? Don't they, they know that these deep alive people are untouchable? And then they will drive them out. And we've had these stories as the child will stand on the road. And then somebody will come and say, what are you doing here? And the child will tell the story. And this fellow will bring this child and take the child in the vehicle, get near the house, and then will say, can you recognize your house now? And at the time when the child says, here is a house, that man will vanish away. That's the appearance of angel. The appearance of angel. Because the angels are still appearing today. Just very recently, just four months ago now. An illiterate woman got converted. This illiterate woman had done very many terrible bad things. But then she gave her life to the Lord and she became born again. And after the new birth, she was still doing her normal work. She went to the farm to gather sticks together. She brought the sticks, uh, the wood to the side of the road and was binding them together. Then a woman appeared. And this woman, according to her, had no jewelry on her, had no painting, had no palming, and then was cap and was a wearing sandal and dressed, uh, you know, normally like uh, a sister, like a child of God. And then that other woman, the strange woman that appeared, uh, I'm not talking of strange in the form of a, a immorality, I'm talking of a person that this woman had never seen before helped her to carry the uh, bundle on her head and then started telling her now you have repented now you are born again don't do the things you were doing before but now that conversion will only be complete when you have made your restitution and that uh, other woman was telling this converted woman saying remember what you have done you must make restitution until you do that that is uh, the thing is not complete and while they were going and she was talking to her on the restitution, all of a sudden, this other woman vanished. She couldn't see her anymore. And being a newcomer, she started wondering, what kind of appearance is this? What kind of a message is this that this woman uh, gave to me and now I cannot see the woman? And uh, then uh, she did it, she was still thinking about it. And then she slept at night. When she slept at night, in her dream, she saw exactly that woman in that same dress, in that same, in that same uh, posture and said, Do you remember what I told you the other time when I helped you to put a bundle of sticks on your head? That those restitutions are very important. And then she was uh, saying, what are those restitutions? And then the other woman that God has sent in that dream said, number one, number two, number three, and went to number 20. This woman woke up in the morning. She remembered everything. She went to her pastor, the Palai pastor, and said, see what somebody told me. And then she could not write. They helped her to write everything, all the 20 items. And then the pastor, that pastor who really knew the word of God, said, If that woman appears to you again, ask these questions from her. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe he lived a sinless, holy life? Do you believe that he died on the third day he rose again? That you must ask those questions from that woman if she appears again. 
and one day that woman that's the converted woman was inside her house and this other woman appeared again and knocked at the door. And then when she opened the door, she saw this woman and said, Ah, where have you gone? You were helping me the other day to put uh, the load on my head. And then after you had told me about restitution, then you went away. Where is yours? Where are you living? The woman avoided answering that question. And the woman just uh, said, I just came to remind you that those restrictions, you must do them. And uh, those uh, 20 items, you must make sure that you do them. And then there were some of them relating to life. That means, uh, you know, she had uh, destroyed pregnancy. She had done evil things by occultic means. She said, before you do those ones, go to your pastors and ask them questions. But the one relating to the fowl you stole, the goat you stole, and the other materials, uh, the bucket you stole, that one, go and do that one immediately. The other one relating to taking life and all that, you must not do anything about until you see the, your pastor. And then this woman remembered the questions he gave her and said, Do you believe that Jesus is Son of God? Oh yes, she said, Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that he lived a sinless life? Oh yes, the woman replied, she, He lived a sinless, holy, perfect life. Do you believe he died on the cross and rose the third day? And the woman said, Oh yes, he died and they rose again. But then they didn't tell the woman to ask about the coming of the Lord. But the woman herself said, not only that he rose from the dead, the Lord is coming again and he will soon be coming. And the woman asked and said, can you tell me the time Jesus will come again? And the other woman replied, I don't know the time. Nobody knows the time here, but it's coming again and it's very soon. And the woman departed again. And you see, this is the appearance of an angel, actually, talking to this woman, confirming her, confer her conversion. Not only that, telling her that uh, this is the way a believer ought to live, and that the believer ought to make restitution. And then I asked the pastor who told me that, I said, how about the dressing of that Christian woman? That's the converted, ah, uh, the, the pastor told me that. She said the way that woman dressed with the scarf on her head, with uh, no painting, with no jewelry, with not, nothing at all, that that woman dresses so correctly, you will think that she had been in deeper life for more than 10 years. Because actually an appearance of an angel had come to her and now she's really living a brilliant, wonderful Christian life. What I've told you now happened just last December, just about uh, four or five months ago. And so the Lord is really still doing it. A remarkable instance occurred at the time of the First World War. A chaplain who served in France told of some experiences. He was commissioned to serve with a detachment at Mons. That's the name of the place where he was serving. That's the chaplain. There's another story now. And uh, during the period of fighting in that region, there was a large body of the English soldiers surround who became separated from the main army and were just about to be surrounded by the enemy. They saw no hope of escape. But they made up their minds that they were not going to surrender. The enemy was advancing down a long slope toward them. This chaplain with thousands of others who were gathered there watching the approach of the enemy. Uh, this is what he said all at once. The Germans halted. That is, the enemies, the Germans who were coming uh, to obliterate, to wipe out, to annihilate, to destroy these other soldiers. Someone spoke from behind him and said, Look, he turned, he stated that in the space above these soldiers, he saw ranks upon ranks of angels, every one of them with drawn swords. All the soldiers there saw it. The enemy halted and presently turned and retreated. Thus that whole body of soldiers who expected to be destroyed and killed and slain or annihilated, they were saved. This has been documented from one, more than one source. I've read the story myself from uh, different sources. There is no question to it about the ministry of angels today. 
God still sends them for the protection of his own. We don't always see them. Sometimes we see them. But they are always there. Do you know that if you are a believer, you can rest assured that the angels are around, they are protecting you. That is the reason there is nothing for you to fear. Do you know the heritage of the believer? The word of God is in you. You have the promises of God. Even Christ, the very Son of God, by His Spirit, is living in you. Not only that you have a power within you that is greater than any power on earth, you are also surrounded by a bodyguard of angels. Within and without, there is protection for you. On the way, anywhere you may find yourself, there is protection for you. Because of the ongoing ministry of the angels according to the assurance of the word of god the angels of the lord encamp round about them that fear the lord and he delivereth them that's the word of the lord to you for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways i will need to magnify the lord and to glorify him and to praise him because of the great things he has done he has protected us so much, not even an air of your head can fall to the ground without the knowledge of your Father. Why don't you rise up on your feet and give the glory to God? If Christ is greater than the angels, you don't worship angels, you worship Christ. You honor Christ, you adore Christ, and you consecrate to the Lord because of the great manifold provision He has made for your life. See how great God is. See what great things the Lord has done. And then honor him, adore him, and worship him. And then Christ, our Savior, is also the creator of the angels. He loves us so much, he has even sent the angels for our protection and for our deliverance every time. Those angels are ministering spirits, and they are ministering unto you in the day, in the night, on the road, in the church, anywhere. That's why there's nothing for you to fear. How about witches and wizards? Nothing for you to fear. How about demons and familiar spirits? There's nothing for you to fear. The angels are mightier than all of them put together. And your life is seed with Christ in God. Pray to the Lord today. And come next week. There is much awaiting us as we come next week. Pray and make sure that you really break through in your prayer before you go today.